Okay. Hello. Um, welcome to Dan Bradbury's presentation on saving land, saving species. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Um, well, let me see if I can share my screen. Let's see if I can get technology to work. It should be a green button at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. You can you can you see that? Okay. We can. Okay, excellent. Right, so so what I'm going to do for kind of the next 40 minutes is talk to you about uh, World Land Trust um, and our approach to conservation. So we're a UK-based charity, um, and um, we have an emphasis on saving land. So technology is letting me down. Hang on. So, um, so our mission is to help people across the world protect and restore their land to safeguard biodiversity and the climate. So, and that's a, the, the first sentence or part of that is really key to what, what we do. So what we do as an organization is we don't put any people from the UK into any of the projects around the world that we support. All of those projects are managed by local people, local communities, um, because we believe that's the only way a conservation project will really, really work, truly work. And there's lots of reasons for it, but the main one being is that they really understand those landscapes. They understand the intricacies um, in these areas. And, and to be completely frank, they understand the politics as well. And I think that's really important. But like anywhere else in the world, local people just want opportunities. So if you provide them the opportunities, then they will buy into these projects. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this man, but this is our patron, Sir David Attenborough. So we're really proud to have Sir David Attenborough as a patron. And I think he sums up best what we do. And it's to save species, you must save ecosystems. And to save ecosystems, you must save land. So for us, as our name suggests, land is the most important aspect of any project. So land is a place that will provide um, a home for many different species, biodiversity um, on a high level. Um, it will be storing carbon and locking in carbon as, to tackle the climate uh, crisis that we're facing. It also provides resources for local people. Um, it also provides barriers against extreme weather conditions as well. So like I say, land, land is the real emphasis here, and we believe this is the right way to do it. You know, you could say you're going to save um, an orangutan for the purpose of this of this um, presentation, but unless you've got somewhere for that orangutan to live and thrive, then you know you've got a real issue. So land again becomes this real important part. And again, as we to carry on through this, we'll be talking. I'm going to mention things like tree planting. You can't plant trees unless you've got somewhere proper to plant them. So what have we done as an organization? So we as a team, there's only around 30 of us. Um, but what we've managed to do in since we were founded um, uh, just over 30 years ago, we funded the direct protection of two oh, well, 2.6 million acres of habitat. Um, so and that's roughly the size of Jamaica. So this is what we have directly funded. Um, but what that's done with our partners, we've managed to leverage um, from with other funders um, um, and other grant bodies to and other organizations to protect 5.8 million acres. And that's the size of Belize, which is this kind of really lovely circle for World Land Trust, because our very first project was in Belize, um, where we were protecting an area of forest, which was going to be cut and was going to be cleared for agriculture. And it was around about 110,000 acres. So this is a big, big, uh, big area of land. So anyway, what we've done is with our partners is protect an area around about the size of size of the country. And what we've also done since our, our foundation in Belize, we've also now with other organizations created an area of forest, which is um, links to our very first project. 
um, which has now created a forest that, and a reserve that's the largest area of standing forest in Central America. So that's something we're really proud of. But I talk about these this network of partners we've got. So what we do is we fund around 30 partners around the world. And those as a group collectively, um, that connectivity have connected around 25 million acres. So which is a huge area. But what we do know is that we need to do more. And we and we will continue to, to to work towards that as we find um, as we need governments and things to catch up. What we talk about a lot about is buying time. So as an organisation, we will continue continue to do that. As I said, land is our first is the first part is you know that's our priority is protect the land. But what we have also done for our organisation is plant two point six million trees. And I, we use the word native trees as well. So we um, and that's really important. If you're going to plant trees and you're going to recreate forests, is you recreate the forest in the right way. Um, so where are we working? Um, we have partners all around the world, as our name would suggest, all the way over from Malaysian Borneo um, into Vietnam, India, Pakistan. Um, we now have a lot of projects in um, Africa. Um, we're in Armenia, but as you'll spot from this map, a lot of it is in Central and South America. And there's lots of reasons for that. Um, one of them is because, uh, you know, lots of places around the world, for example, in Vietnam, you can't actually own land. And that's the same in Africa as well. So, so what we use is we use different methods and different models. So in Africa, um, as one example in Tanzania, what we do is we, play, we pay subsidies to um, local communities um, to create community reserves who will then manage the forest in the right way for conservation. So again, putting local people at the absolute heart of it. And if we're going to ask them to manage their land in the right way for conservation, then they should be rewarded for that as well. But over in Central and South America, you can buy land. And as we said, this is where part of the world where we started um, um, our, our work um, with local partners there. And the other thing around this part of the world is the, the deforestation rates and the threats are, are high as well. But also they believe around about 50% of the world's biodiversity is in this kind of northern part of, um, of South America. Um, yeah, and we're working in um, some incredible places. Um, obviously, hopefully you can see my mouse hovering over. You'll know about the Amazon and you'll know the issues the Amazon face. But actually... The things that are happening in the Amazon are happening on a grand scale elsewhere as well. So during the first pan or first lockdowns during the pandemic, there was lots in the news around the fires that are happening in the Amazon. Well, actually, in that period of time, we were seeing them in Paraguay. We were seeing them in Bolivia. We were seeing them in Mexico, Armenia. So they were all happening all around the world. And I think it's really important that the Amazon, yes, has become this really amazing flagship for conservation. But what we need to do is we need to kind of make people aware of the bigger picture as well and actually you know we've got two projects now in um in brazil um in the atlantic forest and to give you a perspective of that what's happened in um in the atlantic forest is we've lost 93 percent of that forest there's only seven percent of that forest left so this forest isn't a large area this is fragments of forest as well so I'm going to show you some pictures of where what we've done is we've done some protection and we've done some regeneration through tree planting to see the impact that, that people can have. But the other thing about it is that we're also known as new discoveries. We know there's new species there. So, um, you know, I've got a fascination with birds and dragonflies in particular. And with regards to dragonflies, you know, there's I think there's over 180 um, different dragonflies and damselflies in, in this particular project. But just so you know, we're not buying this land up just anywhere. Um, this is um, these green green areas that have now appeared on the map. These are the world's biodiversity hotspots. These are the areas that have been identified as high in biodiversity value. And this is really, um, so it's really key that we are working in the right places. So, um, so as you can see, our projects focus in, in those landscapes. Um, but the other thing about it is that we know there's lots of organizations there's lots of organizations working around the world you know we're quite a small organization so so what we need to do is work in these places where we can have the biggest impact we can with our funds 
so what are threats um all the all the good stuff as you can imagine so um you'll know what the picture is on the left so this is palm oil um so um and again this is a really complex um area and it's something that comes up regularly in conversations so um what we've done as an organization actually is we've signed up to um support um projects with sustainable palm oil so instead of saying that you should ban palm oil what we're saying along with around about a hundred other organizations is if you're going to use palm oil make sure it comes from a sustainable source because palm oil is as i said is this complex thing but what it is it's hot, really high yielding it yields year on year and doesn't actually need that much space the issue is globally we use far too much of it so the issue actually isn't the oil is actually the amount we consume because you know the scary thing is if it wasn't palm oil it could be something else which uses nine times the amount of resources needs huge even larger areas to produce the same amount of oil well so what we say is if you're going to use palm oil make sure or buy products with palm oil in make sure it comes from a sustainable source um and it's traceable um but ultimately just stop stop buying so much of the stuff you know and we're all guilty of it um going around these pictures top right is the one that we've spoken to um to all of our partners the partners have highlighted the biggest issue to them is climate change um so as you will all be aware we're dealing with a climate crisis and a biodiversity crisis at the same time sometimes we forget the second part so we talk purely about the climate crisis but there's a biodiversity crisis as well we're losing species at a rapid rate of knots so this was a fire in patagonia in argentina um, but we also had one in bolivia that was on a similar scale which was around about 30 kilometers wide um, at its uh, at its peak and traveling at a rapid speed as it traveled through um through the landscape um other things bottom right of this picture is rosewood um really complicated but what we know is that this was in Guatemala that we know that actually some of the local cocaine producers actually stopped producing cocaine because they made more money from illegally extracting rosewood from the forest to ship overseas to make furniture and musical instruments so which is just for me was completely mind-blowing to, to hear that then you've got um Paraguay which is the center at the bottom this is the Gran Chaco we're losing around about um I think it's around about 45,000 acres so about 45,000 football pitches every month which is being cleared for agriculture so um so they can either graze cattle on it so people then can have the beef for cheap beef burgers or to grow soya to feed the cattle so people can have cheap beef burgers so it's this kind of thing that um it's all of these things there's always this knock-on effect and then there's mining and, and mining is this really complex issue again of actually they need to create these huge holes quite often in the middle of rainforests and actually only one percent of what's taken out of the ground is actually used the rest of it is waste so again nothing simple there's lots of threats happening um and ultimately regardless of what we do without trying to preach to anybody not saying that i'm perfect or anybody that that i know is perfect we all add to the the pressures that we're that we're seeing so what's our strategy so over the next five years um our plan is to bring another million hectares of land into conservation um and connect, connect another two million hectares so that just to put that in perspective we feel this is so important and it's important that we do something that's the equivalent of what we've done in the last 30 years so we're setting ourselves some big targets but what we believe at the moment is and as we know and you'll all have heard that we believe that we're kind of we're in that most important decade to avoid um catastrophic climate change we believe that we need to do this so we need to step up and we need to step up what we're doing so um so my task is to speak to people like you make you aware of the issues that um, our planet faces and yeah and then get on board with what what we're doing so so what I'll do is I'm going to talk through some of the mechanisms that we have for for carrying out this work because because ultimately as you'd expect if you want to buy land or pay subsidies you need funding and so that's this is what we do but what we have is we have these different mechanisms that me mechanisms for conservation 
So the first one is something we've called the buy an acre scheme. And this is what we did at the very beginning. And this is really ties into how we how we carry out conservation projects. So this is buying land and protecting land. And again, putting it into the ownership of those local communities. And actually, what's really interesting at the moment is that we can still buy land. And I can I only know it in uh, British pounds. And I apologize. But for £100 an acre, we can still buy land in some of these countries. So at the moment, we have some key projects in um, Argentina, the, the Catcher Woodlands in um, Kenya, uh, the Somancura Plateau in Argentina as well. And if you've not seen the Somancura Plateau, you really need to go and have a look at some images. This place is incredible. So, um, and then the Atlantic Forest in Brazil. But as this says, all of these projects, we only work in these places if there's actually a threat. So we're not there just buying up land in places like in your back garden, um, your houses or the local parks. This is places where there is an absolute threat and there is a biodiversity value to it. And the threats as we, you know, we've been through some of that um, already. But why are these places important? So um, for many different reasons, again, so this picture on the right hand side, the big picture, this is the Atlantic Forest in Brazil. Um, incredibly rich one of the most important biodiverse places on the planet incredible bird life and other species but these two little images here so this is the l let me introduce you to the l rincon stream frog and the naked uh, titian fish these are found only in five streams on the somancura plateau they are found nowhere else on the planet so they are there we also know there is the somancura frog which is found in one lagoon and this is why we need to protect these places. We need to protect them for the species that we're all aware of, that are on the least concern, because at what point do they become threatened? But actually, to understand these landscapes, you need to understand all of the species there. So to find, still be finding new things, it's incredible. And, you know, it's something that we're really proud of and really proud of with our partners. And just kind of touching again on land and why land is so important. So there was a report that was done, you know, this one's from 2015. And actually what it says is that land acquisition and land use sector could be 50% of the short-term mitigation potential and nearly 40% of the 2030 emissions gap. So land, believe it or not, has been really undervalued in this challenge that we face with um, the climate crisis. There's a lot of emphasis is put on technology, you know, and I've been asked um, in uh, when I've been doing presentations and talks, you know, would World Land Trust invest in technology? Well, actually, World Land Trust invests in the originals. World Land Trust is developing or is um, funding the protection of trees and land that do all of these things for technology. So we will continue to do that whilst technology catches up. Technology will, and inevitably, we will have to play a really important part in what we do um, and how we tackle this. But land, land use, and this is the important bit, and it's big orange boxes, landscapes can save us more than renewables, energy efficiencies, and transport combined. Which is a really big statement if you think about these are the things that we talk about and we get told a lot about. But in 2015, the UNFCCC was saying, look, protect land, manage it in the right way, and actually it will have a bigger impact than all of these things that we're being told to do all the time. Do all of those things as well, you know, and just think of what the impact will be. Um, so this is what I wanted to show you around about land, because hopefully this video is playing. If not, I'm going to be talking for a couple of minutes and you're not going to be seeing anything. Um, so this is Belize. So hopefully you know where Belize is. So kind of to the side of Mexico between Mexico and Guatemala. And I wanted to show you this. So this green outline is the outline of the reserve that we found we funded, our original project. And if you look at the areas up at the north of this and to the right hand side of the screen, what you'll see is you'll start seeing these brown patches. And this is deforestation. So this is land that's being cleared for agriculture. And what you will see is that this will start to speed up. But what it shows and can demonstrate is actually protecting land and protecting these landscapes, you can really, really work. Um, and this is what we need to do. So you will all have been read, uh, listening to and reading about the various different COPs that have been happening. 
and there was COP26, the one that was held in Glasgow in Scotland. Um, so this is, sorry, just jumping back. So this is what I videoed whilst I was there. So they don't, so if there's even a mound, they bulldoze that flat. But I just wanted to point out when it comes up into the next little clip coming up is this is the entrance to reserve. So you can see the absolute difference that reserve makes. But what I was saying about jumping back, what I was saying about COP26 is, and that video demonstrates it pretty well, is there was lots of commitments were made. So around halting deforestation by 2030. Um, but just be aware that those, those um, commitments were also made in 2015. But what we've seen is an uh, increase in deforestation. So what we need to do from um, those COP26 is we need to make sure that we hold all of our governments and we hold all of the policymakers accountable for those commitments they've made. Because without that, you know, at the rate we're going, and if they continue it going, is by 2030, there will be nothing to halt. So we need to make sure that we kind of, um, we keep the pressure on. So whilst we're talking about tree planting, so we have our tree planting um, program is, they did a, there was a report done by Kew Gardens in the UK with scientists there, and they said there were the 12 golden rules of tree planting. The first golden rule of tree planting is protect the existing forest first. So there's no point planting trees if you're going to continue to cut down trees. Um, and I've got some figures to show a little bit later, actually, why it's important to continue with those, um, those, um, those standing trees. Um, and again, the other good thing for us is that planting, uh, putting local people at the heart of tree planting projects is key to the success as well. So um, I kind of talked a, bot of, of a lot about land and, you know, and yeah, tree planting being this secondary thing, but I want to demonstrate what we've done and how it's worked. So this again is the Atlantic forest in Brazil. What you'll see here, um, hopefully you can see my cursor moving. So that's palm. That's a palm oil plantation. Um, so, um, and what we did, so this is what it looked like in March 2018. This is what it looked like two years later. So this is the impact that tree planting can have. Um, it can start to connect these islands of forest, increasing gene pools in species. Um, it can halt um, um, add monoculture, agriculture, um, and what happened here was that once this had grown, what they actually saw for the first time in around 15 years, they heard howler monkeys pal passing through this landscape. So, you know, something that they're really proud of as a partner. Um, carbon, carbon offsetting. So this is kind of hot topic, um, certainly in the UK. I don't know whether it's, it's been the same um, in the US, but there's kind of lots of difference, differing opinions around carbon offsetting. Um, but we use carbon offsetting as a mechanism for conservation. I think if you really looked at any carbon project, you know, some of them aren't perfect, but ultimately, but we really believe in ours because we carry out all of the good things that we expect from, um, that you would expect from a carbon project. So for it to be a carbon project, you have to measure the, um, the carbon that's sequestered in that area. You have to be able to demonstrate there's a threat. You have to demonstrate there's a positive impact on biodiversity. You also have to um, demonstrate the, the positive impact it has on communities and local people. And that can be from providing health care through to um, providing livelihoods and jobs. So a carbon project needs to have all of these. And our projects really stand up against those. So just as a kind of a quick one, this is this is our project in Vietnam. So this is in the, the Anamite lowland forest. Um, so this is one of the only areas of standing forest that's left, um, but it's home to an incredible speed number of species. So um, this is one of our favorites. Um, this is the critically endangered red shank duke. Um, highly recommend looking them up. I feel very privileged to actually have seen them in the wild, but their numbers are on, on reduction because of hunting. So whereabouts is it? It's around halfway down Vietnam um, on the border of Laos. Um, and again, this is um, a really, really rich landscape. Um, as I've said, there's kind of all of these threatened species in there. But just to put it into scale, so this is an area around 52,000 acres. 
we believe in the next 20 years, over 20 years, will be about a million tonnes of carbon will be protected in this landscape. Um, but importantly, remember I was talking about land and protecting land, is that we believe there's an estimate of around about 10 million trees in this one forest alone. Now, think about how long that would take to plant and establish that forest. Um, in there, there's around 700 species, as I said, and up to 40 of those are threatened, endangered, or critically endangered. Um, and, and, you know, and it signs off on around about nine of the um, UN SDGs, so the um, Sustainable Development Goals. So, um, so, yeah, really, really important project. But just to quickly show you this, so, and it's more about this kind of last, last three column, or last three uh, lines in the, on the, both these columns. So there's a lot of talk about planting trees and the importance of plant, planting trees, and that is true. Um, but what we know is that actually this project in um, Vietnam, in, one, in the first year, it will estimate the carbon benefit will be around about 50,000 tonnes. Now, on a tree planting project, that's not possible because those trees aren't established and aren't ready to do that. Five years, we're looking at a quarter of a million tonnes. Still, the trees in a tree planting project um, that we've looked at, those trees, trees are still not ready to absorb carbon. 20 years of this project in Vietnam, you're looking at a million tonnes. It's around about 20 years where these trees will be established enough to have the same impact that we would that this project was having would have been having 20 years prior to that so it's just something to think about again i'm not underplaying the value of tree planting it's an incredibly important process but we just need to protect what's there because we can have the greatest impact straight away um with any projects for it to be successful you need to have people on the ground so one of the other things that is key to these projects is the our keepers of wild so and what we do is we fund keepers. Um, we provide them with training. We provide our partners with funds to provide them with training to fight things like fires. Um, they're doing the monitoring. They're the guys who are dealing with illegal loggers. These are the front line of conservation. These are the people on the ground. And the projects just do not work without them. So one of our projects um, we've got, um, and again, these are from local local communities. And one of our projects, um, there's a guy um, who used to be a hunter, used to capture things, take them to market to feed his family. He realised the forest was vanishing and this is an area he'd grown up in. And actually, he now works for the organisation. Um, really useful because he knows all the tricks of the trade, probably knows the people are doing it, he knows what to look out for. But what he was really good at is he was really good at mimicking bird call. So now what he does, he leads guided walks he can mimic birds birds come down and instead of him capturing and taking them to the market they come down and there's people stood behind him with big telephoto lenses who want to take photographs of these birds so again it's around providing those opportunities um you know and some of the things that these partners do and i'm sure you will have read around um the rangers and the things that some in some places they're they're um, subjected to, and it'll be happening anywhere in the world. So it happens here in rural England. It'll be the same in North America. They have to deal with things that they shouldn't have to do whilst protecting protecting wildlife and landscapes. You know, in Venezuela, there's been people held up at gunpoint protecting the nests of chicks, um, but they they fended that off, and they continue to protect them. Um, and for me, that's a really amazing thing. And having had the opportunity to meet some of them, you kind of realise how just kind of incredible they, these guys are and what they what they have to deal with. So we kind of covered off a lot about what what Worldland Trust does and how we do it. But what I thought I'd do is just quickly talk you through a project that um, that we've actually just funded. So we raised um, 1.4 million for this project um, in Ecuador. Um, and hopefully this video is playing, and this will give you kind of an overview of what, what we've been doing.
So with that project, yes, it said donate today. There's absolutely no need to donate today um, because we've completed the funding for that project. As I said, we raised 1.4 million pounds for that. And what we were doing is, um, this is a lot, um, the area, so this is central Ecuador. Um, and what we were doing is we were trying to purchase this land here that's in the orange orange lines and this, these orange areas here. So this is about connectivity. This is about joining important habitats. So this is around where the, the northeast or the, the northeastern um, Andes meet the southeastern Andes. There's, there's an area, there's a corridor. This was what we funded um, previously. Um, and actually what's really interesting, there is a road that runs through this area. And what we know is a lot of deforestation happens around, um, around roads. Um, but actually, this road goes through and under the mountains, so actually goes under the reserve. But as it touched on in um, the, the video, is this place is incredibly rich with wildlife. So this is a, a transition area between the Amazon rainforest and the Andean foothills. So this is a cloud forest, um, this limestone, uh, limestone outcrops. Um, and the threats here are, again, things like agriculture, cattle pastures, electricity, roads, land speculation. All of these things are driving up the land price and they're all um, increasing the threats into the, in these areas. Um, but again, this place is ridiculously rich in wildlife. So the partner there, uh, Lou, has discovered a whole new genus of orchid. He's discovered up to 60 um, orchid species. He's discovered new species of magnolia. Um, he's discovered new mammals there. Um, so he found new, new species of rat. Um, you know, and it's full of incredible wildlife. So things like the spectacle bear, the highland mot mot, the brown howler monkey, the Andean cockatoo of rock, uh, which is the, the orange and black bird. Just one of these places on a planet where I would love to visit. So... In this area, as I said, he's this, he's close to 100 species have been discovered in this one area. So it's this, it's kind of like a, I don't know what you want to call it, like a museum of just species that have evolved in this landscape like nowhere else on the planet. Um, so, you know, you've got the black and chestnut eagle that are flying around here globally. There's, I think there's only something like 1,500 of them and, they're, and they've got a good... Um, number of them living in this landscape. This is one of the magnolias, the, the big white flower. This was um, a discovery um, on one walk. He found five new, five new species of tree in one walk in one day. Magnolia was one of them. He took the magnolia back. It was a bud and they waited for it to open and it opened and there was the beetles in there. And so, which was really interesting for them because it was a new species of plant or tree but also they found out how this was being pollinated and what was doing that as well. Um, and then you've got the, the glass frogs um, that have also been discovered there. So for us, um, this was um, a land purchase. This was one of our true land purchase projects around buying land, protecting land. Um, and, and, not, and then we also funded other activities within here. But I went to this frog, which I wanted to show you as well. This was only been named this year as a new, or at the end of last year as a new species. Um, so this is a new species of frog in this landscape. Um, and it's been named after Seth McFarlian. So this is the Seth McFarlian frog. Um, so, but it took four years to name it um, because um, there are so few of them. It took four years to find enough samples to determine that this was absolutely a new species of frog. Um, I'm going to leave it on that slide. Um, so this is what Sir David Attenborough has said to uh, said about us: um, that the money that's given to the World Land Trust, has, in his estimation, has more effect on the wide world than almost anything else he can think of. Which is some, which is a really big statement to be made um, for an organisation of our size. So, just want to say thank you um, um, for listening to me. Hopefully it's kind of give you a bit of an idea about what we do. Um, and yeah, and I'm happy to answer any questions if, if there are any. So let me stop sharing the screen.
Hi, yes, Hi. there are questions. There are, okay, good. Okay, so our first one is how do, if any inhabitants respond slash react to having their land protected? Um, so the thing that we is really important to us is that people um, living in- I think you're muted. I'm muted. Can you hear me? No, I cannot. I'm not on mute. Hang on. Let me. Can you hear me now? Hello. 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 Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Okay, cool. Good. Because I, I hadn't changed anything at my end. So, um, so the answer to, to that question is that we can't do any project unless people living in those landscapes um, are involved or buy into it. So there is absolutely, I don't know, there is some accusation um, and accusations have been put up people's doors around land grabbing. That's not something that we do. So it's around, that's why we work with the local organisations and the local communities. So the communities are key to it. And in many project areas, we fund, as I've said, we fund projects that they manage those habitats and they're paid subsidies to manage that that land in the right way for conservation so all i can say is from our point of view they they have to be involved so we've got projects in peru where actually in the whole landscape um it's around about 14 or 15 different villages and communities actually all manage the the land in the right way so um yeah and again they're paid subsidies they've agreed their own forms of taxes and things like that as well um, so, but if those communities don't want to do it, it can't happen. Simple as that. Uh, another question we have for you is, uh, what has been the most successful land con oh, conservation done by uh, your organization? <sighs> um, wow. I think the project in uh, Belize, where we worked with the other organizations, and we've now created this this largest area of standing forest in Central America. Um, I would say the projects I've just shown you about, the work that we've done with our partners in Ecuador um, and some of the other projects we have in Ecuador as well, just to know how important that landscape is and the threats to that landscape, um, I would say would be some of our, some of our big success stories. Um, I'm a big fan of the project we did in Guatemala as well. Um, uh, we've we funded another really large um, project there as well. So I don't know if there is one particular one because they all have their their importance, and it's not just about scale. Um, it's around you know halting threats. Um, we were part of a group of people as well who halted. Um, a bridge and a road being built in Malaysian Borneo, which with the government we're going to build. And we got together with other organisations and we managed to get that stopped as well. So which was because that would have been catastrophic for, for the forest in, in, the, in the area. Could you tell us what steps you took to get your current position? How did you end up at World Land Trust? Wow. OK. Um, right. So I came to it in quite a convoluted way. So I actually trained as an illustrator. So I spent six years at art college. Um, and then my role evolved. And then I my role then became around, I designed packaging. Um, so I worked for the bad guys, so to speak. I then went, whilst there, I, I was doing trend presentations. So I was telling people about what the latest fashion should be, what colors you should use. Um, what was happening on the catwalks around the world, what was happening in interiors. Um, and I soon realized that most of those things I didn't really care about. Um, I then learned how to, um, I was fragrance trained, so I now know about fragrances. But one of the things that um, happened with World Land Trust is our previous CEO was like, right, conservation and conservation projects need many different things. And one of those things is it needs to make money. So I was brought in to manage the social media to start with. And now I've realized that um, 
after 10 years at World Land Trust is I'm too old to manage social media accounts and I've just taken on someone much younger to do that for me because I haven't got a clue about TikTok and things like that. No idea at all. So, um, so yeah, so my role has evolved and, and ultimately I think it's for anybody who has an interest in conservation and this is what I say to everybody is don't, don't shut doors at the start. There's many different routes into it. So they need scientists. We need we need people who can make money. So we need people who understand law. We need people who understand finance. So there's all of these different routes into it. And yeah, and I was lucky. I took one route in and yeah, and I love what I do. And I've, I, I've been here 10 years, so. Uh, another question we have is, uh, how did the World Land Trust go from a smaller organization in the UK to working with global partners and receiving so much funding to save the land? Well, the truth is that um, the organization started for this project in Belize. So um, we were at the very beginning called the Program for Belize. And it was that one project. So our founders um, started the organization in their, their spare room. So it was just the two of them. And it's just grown. So they raised what was needed for the project in Belize. And then once they'd done that and they thought that was going to be a one-off project, is that then somebody said, well, can we do this in the Philippines? And then it's just kind of evolved and it's just carried on going and it's just kind of grown, you know. And now, so we've gone from John and Viv, who were in their spare room, to uh, raising around about £9 million a year for, for conservation. So, All right. What does the World Land Trust do to save land besides simply taking it off the market for others to buy? Others to buy? Do you take action to specifically restore damaged land rather than buy it and keep it the way it is? Uh, yeah, so that that's part of the the tree planting program. So what we do is um, we we look at land because there there is a theory that if you leave any piece of land, then trees will grow. So, but what we do is we um, we protect that as I said that standing forest, and then what we do is we. Um, where it's needed, um, we will then re we'll do regeneration. So that could be tree planting, um, or it can be um, on a large scale in the things that you've seen, or it can be planting within the forest as well. So it's a combination of activities and methods. Um, but yeah, it's not it's not just take it off the land or take it um, from a private owner to put it into conservation, and then you just leave it. There is a certain elements of management that happen as well. So, um, and that can be protecting against fires um, as much as you can. Um, but then it's yeah, the constant um, uh, monitoring, the like I say, the replanting, the measuring, um, and just ensuring its protection, making sure people aren't logging. So there's there's a whole load of management that needs to go on. So. Uh... What has been the most expensive land purchase? Um, actually, the one that I've just shown you, which was um, in Ecuador. So that was for, so I really apologize. I should have checked this before I came on is, but it's 1.4 million pounds. So this is a large amount of, large amount of money. Um, and the way the economy is going at the moment is probably, we're probably similar pound to dollar at the moment. I don't know what, I don't know what it is, but yeah, um, that's been the, the most expensive one that we funded solely but the project again going back to the one in belize um in total um as and all of the other organizations it was around about 70 million so it was a big yeah yeah, yeah you raise your eyebrows it was kind of a big big project wow okay so what has been your favorite land conservation project um Look, I hold my hands up and I um, completely fell in love with Guatemala. Um, I don't know if any of you have been lucky enough to go there, but if you get the opportunity, go. Um, so for me, it was for multiple reasons. So one, um, the, the landscape was incredible. The things I saw were amazing. Um, but the particular land purchase projects that we were we were doing had all of these other aspects. So our partners were um, running women's health clinics as well. You know, I thought I was going to come back from this particular project talking about 
the nearly 200 species of bird that I saw, um, seeing manatee, you know, seeing kinkajou, peccaries, all of those kind of things. I thought that's what I was going to come back for, but actually it was all the other aspects that were linked to it. And these women's health clinics, um, I'll hold my hands up, actually reduced me to tears. You know, I've got a young daughter um, and some of the things that they were telling me about were things that I just couldn't even comprehend could happen. Um, so actually to know that our partners are working with these remote villages and these local communities to provide support to these women in these landscapes um, was something that com just completely uh, blew my mind. But also combined to that, they're working with local fishermen about where to fish. They were building restaurants with communities so then ecotourism could be um, visit those places as well but ultimately I've never felt more welcome somewhere than I, than I was um, um, in Guatemala like I say for me for me I'm not supposed to have projects that I that I like more than others but I but yeah that's that's the project that I've been loving I'm, I'm lucky enough to have been twice so yeah if you get the opportunity to visit visit that's amazing <coughs> excuse me no. Uh, other than the main projects from your organization, do you or others have any sub projects? Um, so all of our partners will be having other projects as well, if that's if that's what you mean. So um, we fund these projects that we're funding. And I think this year we've made a commitment to 70 different different projects to fund and support the funding of. Um, but all of our partners have lots of sub projects so they have lots of other things that are happening um it's not just about our one piece of work they're doing with world land trust because they have funders from all around the world so um so i don't know whether that's answered the question um or what if that's what you meant but yeah we yeah all of our partners have them have these projects going on Uh, what is your favorite part with working with uh, WLT and the most fulfilling part of your job? So the, the God's Own Street is I love things like this. I love talking to people about what we do um, and what what we can do. Because the thing that we really want to be is, and it might not, hopefully it came across in the, the, the presentation, is look, there's lots of things that are happening. We have got these crises happening. but what we want to be is we want to be really optimistic. We want to be able to provide people with the opportunity to, to be part of um, the solution. Um, we can all play a, a part, whether it's a very small amount of money or up to half a million pound of money. We can all do something. Um, and from our point of view is, you know, there's um, like the students um, that at your school, they can all share the material that we, we, we don't, we're not even expecting funds. It's it's just spread the word, spread the word about World Land Trust and what we do. We need that. We need that. Um, we need that kind of ripple effect because we need to do as much as we want to do as much as we possibly can. So again, like I know, we're you're at a different stage in 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 your careers and your life than, than someone like myself, but but you're already savvy on things like social media. So just spread the word around conservation, bring it to people's attention. Um, so, you know, I love, so I love all of those things, but I think the most rewarding thing that comes from this is knowing that I've played a small part in protecting 2.6 million acres of land. Um, I've got young children, so I've got 14 year old twins, and I want them to be able to see the things that I've had been lucky enough to see, because if we don't do something, those things are going to vanish. And I want I want to be able to know that I've done what I can. Um, and I'm doing my bit now because there's a lot of pressure being put on the generations like yourselves and younger to be the people to sort this out. And actually, you, it's not your you can be you can play an important part um and you can do loads but we need to start sorting out a problem now so people of my generation we need to do whatever we can now 
So it's not just left to people, guys like you, to try and solve the mess that's been created because that's 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 just not right. So the most fulfilling thing for me is knowing I've done my bit and seeing some of these projects come to fruition. So when finding somewhere to start a project, do you guys go looking for the area to start it or do people in that area come looking for you? Quick answer is both. So there's, um, we, we have this network of partners. We have a network of people who, who um, tell us about projects. We put out a call for funding um, and organizations can come to us. Um, we've got a conservation team who um, are going to projects. So um, our, our conservation director has just come back from Madagascar. Um, I think next week he, he goes out to um, India and Tibet. Um, no, not Tibet, so India and Nepal. Then he comes back and then a little bit later he goes back out to Vietnam. So it's a combination of all of those things. So some they come to us and some we go to them. So. You're on mute. No, you're still on mute. Now you're off. There we go. Is there any big piece of land your organization plans on buying in the near future? Um, well, actually, yeah, we've got um, a new campaign starting in on March 15th, which is to protect uh, an area of forest in Madagascar. So this is, um, again, the deforestation rates in Madagascar are just scary. Um, I think they've lost something like 80% of their forest cover. Um, you know, and a lot of that has happened in the last decade. This is home to um, the critically endangered. So when we talk about critically endangered, next step is extinction. The brown lemurs, white collared lemur. Um, there is um, bamboo lemur. There's all of these incredibly credible species. But again, this is an area of land that is used by local communities. So they will still be able to take some resources out um, to continue with their cultural activities. Um, but yeah, this is this is the next thing. So the next project. So again, what I would say is in, on March 15th, if you remember, have a look at the World Land Trust website. Um, look at our social media channels. And if I could ask one thing of you guys from this talk is share that um, our social media as widely as possible. Um, like I say, again, I'm not sitting here asking you for money. What I'm just saying is spread the word because the wider that goes, the much better, uh, much better for us. And with, yeah, March 15th, um, yeah, Project in Madagascar. If there was one place on the planet that you would have any project and where would it be? Wow. The truth is, I'm not, I'm not I don't know. Um, I'm super excited about um, our conservation director going to Nepal. I think that would be um, an incredible place to, to have a project. Um, I have a slight, and I have an interest in places like Tibet. I think that would be great, but somewhere like Mongolia would be really cool. But I'm not. I I can't really say what the threats are in those in those landscapes. But the, the God's honest truth is that doing more in places like Ecuador would be incredible because, like I say, it's vanishing at such a rate, and we know there's some species there um, that. <laughs> That are still to be discovered. Um, I think that's super cool. But yeah, I um yeah, I can't really put a finger on where I'd where I'd say Madagascar was at was high on the list, but now we're doing it. So I'm kind of yeah, that's exciting. Papua New Guinea would be pretty cool as well. So nice hat, by the way. <laughs> All right. Um, do you have a goal to start a project in every country? Um, no. The answer to that is no, because there's lots of countries where actually there is enough organizations or there is enough funds in those countries to be dealing with the issues that they've got there. Um, 
So, you know, there's some of the threats and some of the most threatened habitats are in, in North America, you know, but for an organization like World Land Trust, we're a small organization. So we need to make our funds go as widely as possible. But, you know, there's some big organizations doing some incredible things um, around the world. And it's not something that we we need to, or feel like we need to be part of all of those. So we will continue to to function where we are. We're always looking for new projects. But, yeah, they have to fill those criteria. Of what are the threats, you know, and what can our funds do? Are there any areas you are staying away from? Um, there's countries where you, we just can't work, you know. So, um, for all of the reasons that we're that we know of. So, um, so as an example, we know there's an, a really good organization in Iran called the Iranian Cheetah Society. Um, so in northern Iran, there is a population of the Asiatic cheetah. So these are the only cheetah that are left or that exist outside of Africa. So it's a small population. I think there's only, I think there's less than 100. But you can't work in these landscapes. Um, you know, there's, so there's lots of places like that where, where we just can't work. And, um, but we know there is important habitat. We know there's important wildlife. And we know there's, um, scientists that that need support but we just can't do that and and i understand that and you know and we wouldn't um but the other places i say are, are, the, are some of the the big countries that just don't don't need our support and you know and and yeah and they just have to be kind of very careful because you kind of start getting into politics and that's not something that that we need to be part of or you need to be part of it's kind of like let's kind of move away from that because we we know the countries that there's complications shall we say all right and then the last question what changes have you made in your own life after working with the wlt for so long does your job affect how you view plastic clothing and other items um so the answer to that is yes so um i took um, so the biggest impact was I took a 50% pay cut to come and work for a conservation organization. Um, so, um, and trust me, I wasn't earning huge amounts. <laughs> so, um, so that was kind of the biggest, the biggest change. Um, I've looked at the travel I do. Um, yes, I had, um, bordering on an obsession with trainers. Um, or sneakers, I think. Um, um, and it just got silly. And I was like, hang on, why am I doing this? Actually, this is just a complete waste of time. Um, again, I think plastic is a really complicated um, area, you know. Um, so, yeah, absolutely minimize the amount of plastic that I use. Um, and I think about, I just think about what I'm buying. So there's a really good documentary on um, Netflix called The Minimalists. Um, they take it to the extreme. You know, I think the guy's got like, if you've not seen it, it's got something like five shirts, two pairs of trousers, um, one chair. And it's like, wow, okay, that's that's the extreme. But what I took from it was at the very end, and this would probably be my one one thing that I would or, or one takeaway from this is that that towards the end of the program what he or this documentary what he said was look he's not telling anybody to do all of that to go that minimalist but what he's saying is if you're going to buy something make sure it's got a reason or a purpose so if you're going to buy something make sure you use it make so if you buy a book read it you know don't just stick it on a shelf um if you're going to buy, you know, whatever, if you're going to buy a pair of trainers, wear the trainers. Don't have, you know, I was, like I say, I was guilty of I it. Mean, I had God knows how many pairs and they were all in boxes and, you know, I'd wear them once and then they would kind of be box fresh. And, you know, and it's like, well, actually, this is just ridiculous. And the thing I took away from it is so everything that I buy now, it has a purpose. 
And what I do is when I'm buying food, I buy food based upon what I'm actually going to cook that week. So to reduce the waste. And actually what you end up finding is that actually you end up saving money, which then allows you to do other things. You know, I, I say I took I took this 50% pay cut to go and work for World Land Trust and I ended up with more money in the bank because I was happier. I was doing something I cared about and um, and I wasn't wasting money just trying to make myself happy. I was actually, I was just, just reflecting on it, you know, and there's so many things you can do and there's so many things that you can do while still being able to enjoy yourselves. And that's why I would say to you, look, enjoy yourselves. <laughs> so don't have some guy who's 46 years old sat here kind of going, you can't do this, you can't do that, you, you mustn't do this. Just all I would say is just take a moment to think when you're doing, you know, you're buying something, just go, right, do I really need it? <laughs> you know, I could I could save the money and I could, I could do something else really cool. Um, or no, actually, I do need it, and that this is the reason why. And that that's all I would say. No, those are the changes I've made. And you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I'm perfect because I'm not. You know, we all have an impact. We can't we can't avoid it. So it's just lessening the impact that we have. Um, yeah, hopefully that answered the question. It didn't sound too kind of idealistic, but yeah, that's what I would say to you guys. Thank you. All right, we do have one announcement before we end today. Uh, the National Biodiversity Teaching is a student project that happens because we have so many partners supporting us. One of those partners is Earth Eco International. We are we are excited to partner with Earth Eco International to promote an opportunity to empower our peers across the country. This year, Earth Eco is excited to open our Earth Eco Challenge STEM competition to students in the US grades five through nine. 10 finalist teams will advance for a chance to win the top prizes of $1,000, $2,500 and $5,000. If you have any questions, please email us. Thank you so much for your time and for your presentation. We really appreciate you being here. No worries. And yeah, thank you. Well, enjoy the, the rest of your day. And um, yeah, good luck anybody who enters that competition. It sounds great. <laughs> cool. Bye. Thanks a lot, guys. See you later.